This episode is brought to you by Collaboration, the process where two or more people or organizations work together to complete a task or achieve an objective. As you know, Collaboration has a long history of bringing people together to accomplish worthy goals that seemed otherwise impossible, like the smartphone or the polio vaccine or the 1940 conquest of France. Listen, Collaboration is tired of being reminded about that one. Remember, Collaboration does not warranty or support its product for uses outside of the terms of service. And now Collaboration invites you to join its project to take down those under Underhanded IP infringers, cooperation. Remember, cooperation is not the same as the trusted service collaboration that you've come to know and love. Yes, cooperation looks a lot like collaboration, and you can be assured collaboration has top lawyers looking into that. But collaboration is like the parts of a fine, expensive watch working together to deliver the time of day to you. Cooperation is like a bunch of amateur nerds working on separate parts of the time of day across the country from each other. Hey, I'm still waiting on those minute coordinates you promised me. Oh, never mind, just give me the next minute. What? You have to start all over? Anyway, thank you, Collaboration, for sponsoring the Rereading Wolf podcast. You can't read a Gene Wolf story. You can only reread a Gene Wolf story. Welcome to Rereading Wolf. Hi, I'm James Wynn. And I'm Craig Brewer. Welcome to this bonus episode of Rereading Wolf. Today, we're talking to the famed writer, editor, anthologist Jack Dan. Something you won't get from his Wikipedia page, Jack is a delight. And he's an easy interview. You just sit him down and he's got a million things to talk about, about the great writers and editors of speculative fiction that he's worked with, about the process and craft of writing. Jack Dan's new novel is Shadows in the Stone. I don't think he spells this out clearly, Craig, but it was part of the thesis of his doctorate. It's set in Renaissance Italy in an intensely, explicitly, authentically Gnostic world. I don't mean Gnostic in effect like the Book of the New Sun or the Book of the Long Sun or the Wizard Knight. I mean it is a Gnostic freaking world, like mm-hmm. the teachings of the Manichaeans and the Ancretites of Tatian and Severian in the second century and legendary Simus Magus and Trismegistus. How do you say that name? Um, <laughs> Trismegistus. I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's an adventure novel, but it's also scholarly. And by the way, he does have the scholarly portion of his dissertation. He's working on getting that published too. I don't know whether as a, a essay or series of essays or as a, a short book, but that he eventually told us is coming out as well. Right. If you're interested in that all about historical fiction and fantasy and alternate history and, and dealing with all the, the different generic classifications of those. Exactly. Uh, In this interview, Jack rattles off a bunch of names when he talks about friends and fellow writers that he's worked with. So I think it's a good idea to brief you all on some of them, just in case, you know, for those who might be less familiar with the genre of that time period. Uh, Gardner Dozois, if you don't know who he is, then go to a bookstore and just take a quick look at the anthologies and the science fiction fantasy section. He's a titan from the 70s right up until when he passed two years ago. And Gardner Dozois' wife, Susan, was the writer, Susan Casper, who we unfortunately lost a year before Gardner. Pamela Sargent, who Jack Dan met in college along with George Zabrowski, great writer, but if you know her from nothing else, then you'd at least recognize her from her Women of Wonder anthology series, collecting female science fiction fantasy authors. I'd be surprised if it's ever been out of print since the 70s, or maybe the Star Trek metafiction she wrote in the 80s. Annie, Annie McCafferty, well, you know, Dragon Writers of Pern. Damon Knight and Kate Wilhelm were married and writers. As Jack notes, Knight's Orbit Anthologies was among the tallest platforms for the new wave writers in the 70s and early 80s. It's where Wolf was a regular feature starting in 1968 with Orbit 3, often with two stories in one volume. Orbit was where, as Wolf famously put it in his dedication to the fifth head of Cerberus, collected novello trio. Damon grew him from a bean. His wife, Kate Wilhelm, was a prolific writer, and among her famous novels was The Mile Long Spaceship, which Wolf inserted into the library at Port Minazon in the fifth head of Cerberus, right next to where number five's father's books would be expected to be found. It's one of the hints regarding number five's legal name. Joe, the great Joe Haldeman, is of course the author of Forever War, And Joan Gordon wrote a book on his works in the 80s up to that time, just as she did with Gene Wolfe. Jay, Jay Haldeman was Jack C. Haldeman II, 
Joe Haldeman's older brother, a biologist as well as a writer. Nick Gevers is a writer and former Earthless contributor and collaborated with Jack Dan on the anthology Ghosts by Gaslights, an anthology of steampunk ghost stories that's one that includes a Gene Wolfe story you can't read anywhere else at this time, I think. And I'm guessing you own those now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't resist a good anthology. <laughs> David G. Hartwell, Gene Wolfe's de facto editor, it was Hartwell's suggestion that Wolf write a postlude about Severian at the end of the book of the New Sun that resulted in the compromise for Wolf to write Earth of the New Sun sequel. As you know, Craig, only recently have I come to see Wolf's point of view on that and that it makes perfect mm-hmm. sense not to have written that. <laughs> Ellen Datlow, editor at Omni and Tor, and literally dozens of anthologies. Again, just wander down the science fiction section of your local bookstore. Alice Turner was the fiction editor of Playboy and famous Earthlister. George Alec Effinger. This gets muffled, but his friends called him Piglet. He died in 2002, which was a long time ago, Craig, but it doesn't feel like Mm -hmm. it. He always had health problems. He was 55 when he died, not an old man at all by my calculations, and he had so much more he could have created. Gene Wolfe was only a little younger than that when the last volume of the Book of the New Sun came out. And so I think that's all the preamble that a good interview like this requires. So I guess we should get started. Definitely. And just, it's great fun. You know, even when we weren't talking about Wolf, he was just sharing such great stories about if you're a fan and have heard this stuff and these names, it was just so much fun to hear things that I'd never heard before and relationships and anecdotes. It's just a good time. And also Jack is a perambulator when he talks and you can hear his feet step, 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 stepping through the whole thing, which I could see that it was working because it was just such an enthralling discussion. So I didn't say anything and I like it anyway, because it feels like I'm sitting in his kitchen or something while he's saying all this. Yep. So we know it's there. We'll do our best to minimize it as much as we can, but it's just part of the reality of the show. That's right. Okay. Hi, Craig. Nice to Hello. meet you, buddy. Nice to meet you, too. It's a, an honor to meet you. I'll, I'll throw that out there, too. So. Oh, wow. Now you've made my day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been so really excited about that. You guys did a great podcast with Michael. That was oh, well, thank quite you. quite interesting. It was kind of fun to get to ask people, you know, would you like to come talk to us, but not about your stuff, about somebody <laughs> else's. <laughs> yeah, but in a way, that's liberating. And... It was interesting for me because I remember, I, I mean, Michael and, and Gardner Dozois, Susan Casper, and I were like together at the start. And it, as well as I know Michael, I did not know that he knew Gene that well. He, mm-hmm. he, in fact, knew Gene, you know, significantly better than I did. Mm-hmm. So it was wonderful to hear his take on Gene. When did you and Michael Swanwick meet? Well, actually, Michael was a friend of Susan Gardner Dozois' partner, who was also a lovely writer. And she introduced him to Gardner. And I remember I was visiting them in Philadelphia, and Gardner said, I want you to meet this guy, Michael. You know, he carries a notebook around wherever he goes. And this guy, I think this guy is going to be a writer. He's, he's, he's a writer. And I met Michael, and we had long, drawn-out conversations about the understructure of story, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and he, he just had the juice. You can almost immediately tell by the way someone is in the world. He was asking really interesting, deep questions from the get-go, and he turned into <laughs> a major, major writer. And we did a ton of collaborating together. What would happen, we'd all get together in, you know, either either going out to dinner or just hanging out. And we'd just start talking and stories would come out. There, there were times when we'd sit down with an idea and we'd nut it out. But they were in Philly. I was living in upstate New York. And usually the way it would work 
because it was a very easy kind of collaboration from my perspective, is that Gardner would always do the final conforming draft. And we would nut out stories. And then either I would take a first cut or maybe Michael would. And then we'd pass the story around. Or if there was a section of the story that, say, Michael had particular knowledge about, or I did, then I would do that section and pass it through. So we did enough to put together collections of those stories. And Gardner and I also collaborated on a bunch of stories alone. Mm -hmm. And Michael and I collaborated (laughs) once on a story that I really love called Ships. I had just met my partner, Janine. So the world for me was all full of roses and (laughs) tulips, and it was sunny. (laughs) And Michael emailed me the first couple of lines for the story, which would be almost impossible to take anywhere. It was a game. And we started working on it. Well, to make a long story short about the story, I wanted it to be upbeat because I was full of roses. Michael was full of reason and knew where the story should go. And finally, we couldn't agree because basically I was being a schmuck And we took it to Ellen, who, as we say, fixed it, i.e. we went with (laughs) we went with Michael's version. (laughs) And by Ellen, I'm I'm guessing. Oh, I'm sorry. Ellen Datlow. That's what I would guess. Yeah. You know, who's who's a wonderful story doctor, but she's a a friend of both of ours. I, I consider her, you know, family. Yeah. And I considered Gardner family, too. That would not dissuade either one from rejecting a story of mine if they didn't like it. (laughs) (laughs) But we did put poor Ellen on the spot. That really was unfair. (laughs) But we came out with one of the most interesting stories, I think, that we had done. I could go on and on, but I won't. (laughs) (laughs) No, this This is always fun just to hear, hear, you know, people we've read forever and then to find out the backstories. No, that's always great. Well. We called ourselves, we we didn't let the word out because we were afraid that people would tie us into being hacks, but uh, we referred to each other at the time as the Fiction Factory. And in fact, that's what I titled my collection of, of collaborative stories, because during that period, we were selling to the slicks for, you know, what was really very good money. And I don't know how we were doing it, but at the time we were selling to uh, Kathy Green at Penthouse and Alice Turner at Playboy. And, you know, where you might get a couple of hundred dollars in the genre, these markets were paying in the thousands. Ellen was at Omni. And so we had this wonderful period as these collaborations were selling to the slicks. And the interesting thing with the Playboy stories we sold and the penthouse stories, there was absolutely no sex in any of them. (laughs) Uh, The only sex, if you could call it that, was in Slow Dancing with Jesus, which I can't remember if we sold that to Playboy or penthouse, but the last line, Jesus is kissing this young girl. The, The story is this young girl is not pretty, She's got pimples, et cetera, et cetera. No one wants to take her to the prom. So Jesus Christ shows up in a tuxedo with a blue cummerbund and a T-bird and takes her to the prom. <laughs> and of course, as he walks into the prom and looks at everyone there, they all pale and are revealed as, you know, as being paper mache as we all are. But at the end, there's a sexual kiss And I I said, no, we can't have that. And Gardner said, yes, I can. And I said, (laughs) I guess, okay. (laughs) You can see who won in all of these. uh, So, yeah, so it was it was just a wonderful period. And we had all gone to Milford before that. Jay Haldeman, Joe Haldeman, Gardner, George Alec Effinger, Ted White, a number of other people were having workshops in Guilford, at the Guilford section of Baltimore. And I became part of that group, which we later moved to Michael's. 
and called it Filford. The references to the Milford Writers Workshop. So we had the Guilford Mafia, as in the Milford Mafia, and the Filford Mafia. And I mean, we had a lot of wonderful people that had attended. Dave Hartwell, who was Gene's editor mm -hmm. and responsible, I think, in, in a serious way for Gene's career, i.e. being published. Uh, Chip Delaney, it was, uh, I learned a lot as a writer through these workshops, and I made friends who became family. So the idea of workshopping with Michael and Gardner and Sue, etc., was the collaborations were an outgrowth of the workshops because it felt yeah. like we were just workshopping. If that yeah. makes any sense. Oh, yeah. 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 And I think even even your Wikipedia article mentions that one thing that you really do push for is for young writers to get connected in those workshops really quickly. Well, I think, you know, that for a number of reasons. I mean, I, you know, I do a lot of workshopping now in terms of conducting or leading. I don't know what the hell the word is because I consider it a group of equals. But A, you get to know people who are, who are working the same, the same fields. So you're making those connections which are good emotionally and also professionally. And also, depending on the workshops, uh, for instance, the Clarion Workshop, I did a Clarion, Jonathan Strawn and I did a Clarion West last year. And I did two of the Clarions, Clarion South here in Australia. I'm an expat New Yorker. And every week you've got a new person coming in. And basically you're making connections that could be more difficult to make on your own hook. And you're also finding people who are simpatico to the way you write. Whenever I do a workshop, I say, if everything I say sounds wrong to you, that's not because mm -hmm. of you. It means I'm not your person. And the next mm -hmm. one coming through may be the one, you know, to push those buttons. That's why it's so hard to teach writing, because it's so extraordinarily individual. And I won't go on with this, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I'm not sure how unique this is, but I really do kind of associate your career with collaborations. Did you start with George Zabrowski? Is that, I've never said his name out loud. Am I pronouncing his name right? I yeah, should say yeah. that. I was, th I was thinking, why can't you say his name out loud? What has he done now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, look. George Zabrowski and Pam Sargent and I basically were, were there at the very beginning. We met at Binghamton University when it was then called Harper College in an astronomy class. And George and Pam were sitting behind me. And of course, I thought Pam was attractive, so I kept turning around. But we became friends. And later we all ended up either living in the same building, you know, or living together. But I, I was, at the time, I was living with a, a girlfriend of Pam's. I, I was set to take her for a date. And George said that he had edited a fanzine. Well, I didn't know what a fanzine was. But he was in touch with people like Clark. And so immediately I said, well, let's edit a fanzine. And poor Josie Ann had to, you know, sit it out while, uh, while I basically acted like a sexist pig and ignored everything but the idea of writing because George knew he was going to be a writer. And I had always wanted to be a writer. I just had no idea. But, you see, George had always had such faith in whatever he was doing that I bought right into it. And so we started collaborating. And at one point, I think I paid Pam and George a dollar a week and I had a cot in their apartment because I had a couple of places where I was living at the time. And then I moved into an apartment below them and we started collaborating. Not Pam. You know, Pam is a, a, a brilliant, brilliant writer. In fact, genius level. But she, you know, she was not a collaborator. Mm -hmm. But George and I were sitting at, at his old 
1940s, I forget what kind of typewriter, we had to bash the keys with a mallet, and we were writing stories. George took one of them to, uh, to a convention and met Eisler Jacobson and sold the story to Worlds as If. It was a story called Traps. We've also got a collection of, of the collaborations we did called uh, Decimated. You know, it was like we were living the down and out in Paris lifestyle. You know, I mean, it was, a, you know, we were all collaborating. I remember when I came up with the idea for Wandering Stars, we were at Pam and George's. And I think George, I think it was George, it could have been Pam, came up with the title Wandering Stars. And the three of us were jumping up and down on the bed, acting like nine-year-olds. And so we've, we've remained, I guess, family. We keep in touch. George and I did an anthology together called Faster Than Light, which George, knowing Arthur Clark, got Arthur to do an introduction. And it was shortly after that, after all of this was happening, that uh, Annie McCaffrey invited Gardner and myself to collate the SFWA forum because she thought that Gardner and I would get along. Well, Gardner and I had met once, and he absolutely hated me. He thought I looked like a street hood. <laughs> In those days, you actually mimeograph. You did all of this by hand. So we went out to her. Uh, she had this lovely old white mansion in Seacliff, Long Island, with, you know, like seven or eight cats and kids running around in this little tiny room where she worked. And... She always knew when, <laughs> when writers needed a meal. I was living in New York. I had dropped out of law school when I sold the story that, that I think, Craig, was it you or James mentioned to, to Orbit 10? The, uh, I can, the world cage. Right. I can blame Damon and Kate <laughs> for ending my, uh, my law career, which I was not interested in. But I was stupid enough to believe, oh, hell, look, I'll go to law school. It'll give me time to write. <laughs> <laughs> well, that didn't quite work out that way. So Gardner and I met again at Annie's, and he was living in New York then. And we, we kept, you know, we, we hung out. And he, he took me to, to the first Guilford, which is where I met Joe Haldeman and Jay, and Jay and I have written novels, etc. He was a wonderful and a, and a very talented writer. And, right. you know, the rest, I guess, is, is some sort of strange history. Well, we were actually very anxious to talk to you because as an editor, we were hoping to get some insight into how somebody edits Gene Wolfe. I know that you have included at least four Gene Wolfe stories in, in your anthologies. Cause I know, cause I'm looking at three of the anthologies right now. So what is that like? Well, in Gardner and I did an anthology called future power and we published oh. Gene's uh, eye flash miracles. And I did uh, another one called immortal. And, uh, and I published Oh, uh, you know, I always get these screwed up. What was it? It was uh, the death. Yeah, of, uh, the the doctor, doctor of Death Island. And I will tell you, okay, I will tell you the secret to editing Gene Wolfe. Dear Gene, the story's great. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> I swear that was it. And and I'm a very hands-on editor. In fact. Uh, there are some stories in original anthologies I've mentioned that I've edited, which I won't mention which ones, where some of the stories were actually collaborative because <laughs> I would say, this doesn't work for me. I think the juice is there and I'm happy for you to sell it somewhere else. And I don't want to, in quote, piss in the soup, but this is what I think if the writer came, comes back and says yes, sincerely, because 
as an editor, I only want to get to what the writer is really trying to do, not become part of the writer or the story. And there were times when the thing went back and forth. And so I was really hands on. But Gene was, well, as close as I can come to think of as the perfect writer. He was a huge influence on my work. And most of that, I think I understood intellectually, but it was only recently, actually, that I've discovered how profound that influence was. And, and we were friends, but I would see Gene at conventions and I couldn't help myself. I was always hugging him. And there's, if you saw the anthology, the Mooney Fawcett anthology, Shadows of the New Sun. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I wrote a story called The Island of Time. And as the introduction, because you had to, we were asked to say something about Gene. I said, I know two Gene Wolfs. One is an affable, taciturn, witty convention companion whom I can't resist hugging every time I see him. The other Gene Wolf scares the living hell out of me. <laughs> He's the one who writes science fiction and fantasy with the skill and depth of a Nabokov, Borges, or Joyce, a literary genius ferociously bending and twisting genre tropes into high art. A blessing on both your heads, Gene Wolf. <laughs> And in the island of Dr. Death, when I first read that story, well, it immediately became active experience. You know, there, there are some writers and some stories, novels, whatever, that after you read them, they became part of your personal experience in the sense of like your first kiss or the mm-hmm. first time you've made a complete idiot of yourself in public. It binds into, into your memory and influences you as a person. Well, for me, reading that story was like hallucinating. It was just so real. You know, as you know, Gene has a very deaf touch writing about uh, children. He, he just, you know... Once when he was asked about this, he said, well, you know, you know, I was a child, you know, I can, I can remember. But what struck me with the story is that it was written in the second person. A lot of new writers think that the first person is a really good point of view to take because it's so easy to, to write. And so you end up sounding like Joe Blow, who was told he had to write a, an article a month for a trade magazine. And he starts, hello, my friends. I'm sitting here at my typewriter. It's a beautiful day. And I wanted to tell you about Exxon X's gaskets <laughs> and our department. It's actually probably after second person, the most difficult point of view to take because you're limited to that point of view. I wrote a story called The Silent, which is from the point of view of a 12-year-old boy who is left without family roaming around Virginia during the Civil War. And you then have to convey through that character's sensorium the real world around him so that you can cue in the reader to what is actually happening. And that's that's a much more difficult job than taking the, you know, omniscient third person where you can either be God and tell the reader what he needs to know, or you can be a camera, you know, sitting on the shoulder of the protagonist, which is what I did with the Memory Cathedral about Leonardo da Vinci, where you can start wide and say, this is what's happening in Florence, and then narrow in to what Leonardo was seeing and thinking and saying, etc. But Gene wrote that story in the second person saying, you are doing this, you are doing that. And for years, I wanted to take to try my hand. But I, I knew that the only person that I could conceive that could do it 
was Gene because he did it flawlessly. So I took my own awkward stab at it in the island of time, which was my homage. I had that same feeling of, of deep change, I guess you could call it, when I read The Fifth Head of Cerberus. And when, when that happens to me, it's visceral. It's only later that I can go back and try to take apart what was done and enjoy the word play and the metaphors and all of the connective tissue for what it is. I mean, that's all, that's all there immediately. But I think that with a writer that you love, whose work you love, I think different people read different books, even if it's the same book and different stories. It speaks to them in such a different way given, say, you know, my own experience coming up, that a, a lot of the craft, brilliance, and metaphoric meteorites that he, th that he throws around might not be what enthralls me, say, as a critic, to want to write about. Uh, and, and I keep, you know, for instance, it was interesting. I, I was thinking about how, how Gene had influenced my work. And you had asked me about the Gnostics, James. And I suddenly remembered as I was, I was thinking about this because you guys prepare. So I figured, you know, I couldn't do the usual Jack Dan, let's do shtick and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I remembered, you know, I remembered Soldier in the Mist and his character who has to write everything down the because he, he's going to forget it the, the next day. And, and his gift is that he, he can not only hear the gods, he, he can speak to the gods. And I think of Shadows in the Stone and my novel, well, my second novel, uh, the, the Man Who Melted, where the population is bicameral. It was an idea that, that I had got from uh, Julian James who in the 60s and 70s, he wrote a book called The Rise of Consciousness and the Breakdown in the Bicameral Mind. The idea that we were all schizophrenics, in a sense, mm -hmm. that the corpus callosum was as if it was divided. And people could literally hear the voices of the gods. And James believed that consciousness only came about a couple of thousand years ago. So that if you're reading the Iliad, you can read that you know, is a bicameral work. Now, there's no way to prove it's, it's a lovely theory, but whether it's true or not, I have no idea. But I used that in, in The Man Who Melted, and I used the same idea in Shadows in the Stone. It was the idea that people could, that people interacted with angels, demons, devils, etc., cetera, in, in an almost biblical sense, in the way that, that the Bible was written. And so I took that idea that this other world was present, since it might well have been present to them in a sense, and I made it real. Well, what I came to, you know, actually it was after you guys had uh, asked me to, to do the, the, the podcast gig, was that a lot of that probably surrounds Soldier in the Midst. It was very interesting. In an interview, I forget where, and, and I think Nick Givers, who's a wonderful critic and, uh, and a terrific anthologist, and this is self-serving since we've done work together. <laughs> well, anyway, he was interviewing him with, with I think, two other people. And, and someone asked him, in, uh, in some of your work, your characters, hear the voices of God, and they interact with divinity. And it was, a very, it was a very cogent question as opposed to the way that yours truly is framing it. And Gene's response was no comment, you know, which I thought was quite interesting. Now, he did say that he uses myth in his work and he starts with a myth and then builds as he needs it. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is that Gene has really influenced an entire generation of writers, and he's influenced this one. 
in ways that you know that I, that I'm still becoming conscious of, and and this reminds me, even though it's got nothing to do with it, uh, of something that Gardner said years ago. Because if you read Gene's work, it's layered. I mean, Gene was was a genius, probably with an eidetic memory, used language much like Joyce, except I can read Gene and I can't read Finnegan's Wake. <laughs> uh, you and many other people. But his work is, he requires the reader to be involved in, I would say, much of his work. Some is absolutely pellucid right on the surface, especially that scene, especially in his short stories. And I remember Gardner and I were talking about it way back when, and David, David Hartwell, saw the brilliance in the work and, and was devoted to it, even though, you know, it wasn't selling outrageously. But what Gardner thinks happened was when, I think, you know, in the 80s, when it became steam engine time for fantasy, that readers who might not have picked up uh, Gene's work started reading him because it felt like fantasy and that that might have been one of the engines that charged his career. Now, as I say that, I realize that Gene is not known, is not anywhere near as well known in the broader community of letters as he should be. I mean, I think Gene is as important to say Borges. But I mean, this happens, take a writer like Howard Waldrop, who I would at least make the assertion that he's one of the best American short story writers alive. Does he have anywhere near the reputation of a T. Korga Henson Boyle? No, you know, no one, no one outside the genre, you know, knows him. You know, life and letters ain't fair. What was the first story by Gene Wolfe that you can remember reading? You know, it's the first one is, is The Island of Dr. Death. Yeah. I know I read stories earlier than that. I would have been reading him in orbit. But for me, that story combined with Fifth Head which, as you had mentioned, was in Orbit 10, where, where I debuted and ended my law career. Uh, those two stories were flashpoints for me. I wanted to figure out how to do that. Because what Gene did, and this is for me, I can't speak for anyone else's uh, sensorium and how they react, but a lot of writers, and, and I see this in workshops, they have these dream images and they want to make them real because they're so powerful. And so they sit down and they start transcribing them, which I call dream fiction because it's basically impossible to figure out what the hell they're doing or trying to do because they haven't learned the craft. You know, I mean, writing is it's, it's a map. You put your characters on that map, delineate who's doing what, and work it so that the reader can follow you. It's really a sort of cartography. But Gene, through craft and, and genius, managed to write what I think of as waking dreams. And I couldn't get rid of the, the images. I, can, I might not even remember the plot of the story that he wrote. And yet... For instance, Seven American Nights. To me, it, it's perceptually colors, a kind of deepened memory. And so that's, you know, that's how that works for me. I think that's one of the better descriptions of his stuff I've ever heard. I like that yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Well, thank you, because I was, my big worry is that I'm sitting, standing here blathering and making <laughs> absolutely... No sense at all. No, it makes total sense. It makes total yeah. sense. And it, it really works for so many different, so many of those different levels of why they work. Yeah. In terms of books, the book that, that had that, you know, I, I would call it, 
I would call it almost glamour in the ancient sense, you know, in, in the magical sense. It's, it's limed with, with a kind of hyper-reality. And the book that did that for me was, uh, was that the first book of the series was The Shadow of the Torturer. What I found hilarious was that when Gene was asked by an interviewer, you know, about the book, he said he had gotten the idea to write it because he wanted to write a character that was unusual enough to be made into a costume uh, mm -hmm. a for cosplay. conventions. But you see, Gene cannot write badly. <laughs> uh, you know, another writer who has the same problem is Joe Haldeman. I remember way back in the early days when we were all scrabbling around for money, Joe was writing, it was uh, a spinoff of a comic or a movie, but the, the title was Attar the Merman. Okay, so he was writing this book, and I was talking to him, and he said, yeah, he said, you know, I've finished it. He said, I'm, I'm now working through a second draft. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, I'm, you know, it, it, I'm rewriting it so that it's, you know, so that it, it's, you know, it's good. And I thought, you see, <laughs> that's the sign of a real writer. He's rewriting something that should have been written as fast as possible, taking the money, and it, you run. But <laughs> Joe could not write badly. It, it wasn't about the reader at that point. It was that every line had to be as right as possible. Now, I don't know how Gene worked. I mean, there are writers who I do know how they work. I, I mean, like, you know, like the people in my own coterie and writers like Roger Zelazny, who I've watched work. So I don't know how Gene did it or what he thought of it, but that's my take on it. And I think for all of that, from what everything that I've heard and read and, and people I talk to, Gene was a very generous soul. And uh, I found him almost impenetrable as a puzzle. And that could be because of the respect I had for his writing. It could have been because it was a bit of an age difference, but I think it was the writing. I mean, there are writers like Joe, Lucia Shepard, you know, I could go on and on. Writers who, 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 were, who were brilliant, Gardner, Michael, who I think of as peers and pals. But with Gene, I, I think I might have erected this uh, wall of glass out of fear. That didn't stop me from hugging him. <laughs> <laughs> so Gene Wolfe is often categorized in the new wave. You're often categorized in the new wave. What does... What do you think that word means? Well, the new wave was actually a movement. And at the time when I became involved with it, because, you know, I, you know, it started in the 60s and I got involved in the 70s. And it, it really was, I mean, to describe it from my memory, from my visceral memory, uh, it was a zeitgeist. It was this idea that everything was opening up that that you, you could almost do anything and so harlan uh harlan ellison with his dangerous visions uh was one pole and i think i was the last person in the universe uh mm. to sell this the story that i sold to the last dangerous visions because he was a buddy of mine and i didn't want to hurt his feelings ever so i just you know, left it in the, uh, in the draw. The other node was in England with Mike Moorcock and the group. And the other was in Milford, Pennsylvania, and that was Damon Knight and Cape Wilhelm. Now, at the time, they were living in this wonderful old mansion in Milford, Pennsylvania called the Anchorage. And it was like, it was like a Pony Express stop in that at any given time, there would be writers either visiting or staying or, you know, it was really a nexus. 
and very close to Damon and Kate, Virginia Kidd, the agent, was also living there. You know, I, I was published by Damon before I met him, but Gardner and I went to Milford to visit, and that's where I met George Alec Effinger, who was staying with them. And when Gardner got out of the army, he went and stayed at the Anchorage. And so with Kate and Damon, they were like lightning rods for a number of writers, myself, Gardner, Joe, Jim Salas, George Alec Effinger, Gene. And to go to a Milford, you would meet everyone, you know, in the field. I mean, I remember hanging out in, I can't remember if it was George's, uh, we used to call it George Alec Effinger Piglet. I can't remember if it was Piglet's room or where it was, but we had heated up beans, you know, on the heater in the room. And we're all sitting around eating beans. And I'm sitting there, you know, with Jack Williamson eating beans. And there was really no sense that there was an age difference. And some of the best writers working were part of that group. I mean, Kate herself, I, I just, uh, I was privileged to do an introduction to her, uh, the two-volume master series of her, of her work. The Centipede Press one? The Is Centipede one? Press, yes. Which I was, I was mad. By the time I, I saw it, it was sold out already. <laughs> yeah, it sold out, uh, you know. But think of what we think of as new wave writers. Kit Reed, Ursula, Pam Sargent, Sonia Dorman. I mean, they were transforming genre tropes into contemporary uh, literature, into world literature, which is what critics have said that Gene did. And during that period where yours truly was going to men's consciousness raising groups because all of the women that Jack the sexist wanted to date. It doesn't say so here, but the way you're showing me up until is Owen. I had stopped being a, a pig and the civil rights movement, you know, was happening. The world was in turmoil. Joe came back from, you know, from Vietnam seeing things that no human being should have to witness. So, look, a lot of the work was picking up on a lot of modernist trends. Uh, you can see techniques of Dos Passos and, and a number of other writers passing through this new grist mill. And since editors, you know, were open, like New Worlds, I mean, I was publishing a lot of that early work in New World, because they would buy it, it allowed me to experiment and to work through the phony stuff to get to the real stuff. So you have, is it Kit Reed's uh, Joy in Our Cause? Perfect literary short stories that dance around on the genre tropes. And I think it was through that, you know, and then the next, the next zeitgeist, so to speak, was cyberpunk, you know, and that was Bill Gibson's Neuromancer. When that came out, I was up against it with The Man Who Melted. And as soon as I read that, I said to myself, this is something new in the world. And it was through that passage, because I think the, the new wave kind of, you know, allowed this work in a sense. It opened the gates. And now the genre has been co-opted by the culture at large. I mean, you, how many movies out there aren't science fiction? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it's, that was not something we who pride and imagine herself as being able to extrapolate various possibilities would have thought possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you brought up cyberpunk. Yeah. I think are you familiar with the term clock punk oh i think i've heard it but i'm it's it's like cyberpunk however it is science fantasy uh built in the technology of the renaissance and That's is it possible that you are on the verge of becoming the godfather of clock punk 
Well, <laughs> you, I got to tell you, buddy, you, 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 you've got me there. I remember <clears throat> when The Man Who Melted came out and I was getting Cheap Truth, which was like mimeographed and mailed. It was the, the newspaper of, of the movement. And I had said, it might have been to William, I can't remember, that... You know, this happened, you know, after me, you know, I'm not a part of this. And the word I got was that, no, you're there. So I, 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 I keep missing all of these, uh, all of these interestingly named movements. <laughs> <laughs> but you wander through them <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, the problem is I write the stuff and then it all happened. But Bill's conception, I mean, and he said it, he, he, he was looking into the computer. That was the days of Dawes. And it didn't look flat. It looked like that it was three-dimensional. And that idea and his brilliance as a writer, I mean, he's a lovely, lovely writer, changed the direction of the field. Boy, that shut everybody up. Sorry. No. I, <laughs> <laughs> you've got us enraptured. No, it's we great. Can't. Plus, I'm sitting here trying to think, like, is there anything Wolf wrote that, that counts as really cyberpunk? I mean, I guess... Maybe something about the last two books when you have a, a guy who's got a brain filled with and he's a clone of a guy who has been a writer and he has all those books in his memory. But maybe it, it's still not quite cyber. Not quite the same. But. You know, the problem is if 20 years ago you sat down and said to Ray Lafferty, write me a cyberpunk story. Mm -hmm. Well, he would he might write you a cyberpunk story which would not look like mm -hmm. cyberpunk oh, yeah. to anyone but two people. Maybe <laughs> the editor and maybe Lafferty. <laughs> and I think Gene could write a cyberpunk story that would have layers to the center of the earth. Would it be recognizable as a cyberpunk? I think it would be recognizable as Gene Wolfe dancing on tropes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah mm -hmm. yeah let's talk about your uh is this your latest uh novel the uh, shadows in the stone yeah yeah that's yeah. the uh it was funny you know you can't tell when a book is going to do the dance i wrote the memory cathedral about leonardo da vinci and it became a, a number one bestseller here in australia germany did something like you know six editions a couple of hardcovers publisher was calling, was faxing me on my birthday. <laughs> uh, it didn't do that same dance in America, but it, it, you know, it really did well for me. So I wrote The Silent, which I didn't think of as a commercial novel. It did front page reviews here in Australia because one of the major reviewers thought it was important. You know, it, it did the dance with the reviewers, etc. But then I wrote The Rebel, which was an alternate history about James Dean. Mm -hmm. And what if he didn't die in the accident? So I have him hanging out with the Kennedys and, you know, Marilyn Monroe. In other words, I thought, well, you know, that's, that's commercial as hell. It wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, simply, you simply can't call it. And the idea for Shadows in the Stone came as I was, I was thinking of the sequel to The Memory Cathedral. I wanted to write a, I was going to write a book about Da Vinci and Machiavelli, who together, I mean, this is actually true, uh, were asked to, uh, to try to turn a, a river for military reasons to make it go in another direction. And while I was doing that, I was reading a book called The Gnostic Bible, and I got interested uh, in John Dee. Now, in, in, the, in the Memory Cathedral, there's an exorcism, which is one of the strangest parts of the book. And that's, that's actually taken from a real incident. And I had read another book called Eros and Magic in the Renaissance by Io and P. Culliano. And he was actually on the edges of science fiction because David Hartwell had met him and was bringing him into fandom. And he was murdered on the streets, I think, in New York. Oh, wow. 
Mm. But this book was absolutely a brilliant investigation into the mindset of of Renaissance thinking and the way people imagined the world felt viscerally different than the way that we do. I mean, the idea of, say, igneous rays that you shoot out and that if you looked into someone's eyes, you could imbibe their soul in a sense or or a, a version of it, which would poison you and your eyes would remain luminous, but your body would, you know, would slowly sicken. You know, um, uh, it was considered by by doctors as as being a a true illness. Those ideas were working around in my mind. And I wanted to write, you know, another novel set in Florence. And so I came to the idea that what if I wrote, what if I wrote Paradise Lost set in the Renaissance? And what if I had the characters interacting with the angels, as I said, as I mentioned before, mm-hmm. you know, in, in the way that, in a bicameral way, is the way they're described, you know, in the Bible with Ezekiel and all the, you know, all those cool guys. So I, I set it up as an alternate history, although whether it's that or a <laughs> historical fantasy is, is an argument that, even though I've made the argument, the thesis is an argument that I, I'll leave to others. But what I did. And, and this has to do with research, which, James, I think was a question that you had asked. As I was reading the Gnostic Gospels, I don't know if you've read any of this stuff, mm-hmm. yeah, but the... it's like the Bible on acid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. And one can almost understand why the guys, because it was guys, at the Council of Nicaea said, OK, this is all out and this is in. And I, I was taken by the idea of the Demiurge, which is Jehovah, and the idea that he is not the real supreme being, you know, but, but that his, basically his mother went behind the veil where, where she could not be seen by the invisible one, i.e., you know, the true God, and, and gave birth to the Demiurge, who then created his own universe, i.e. the one that we're living in. And as I was researching and and doing the dance, and a lot of it becomes so ingrained that I forget where it happened and what's true, I had the idea that the goal of the Demiurge is to destroy everything, including himself, because that is the only way that he could become greater than the invisible one, than the, the original uh, supreme being. So this the story begins uh, where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And I must admit that you would never see this, but it was influenced by George Martin. You know, George and I kind of came up together. We've known each other, you know, since we basically started writing. And I had said to someone in an email or on, I, I don't remember where it was, I said, I am never going to write a fat fantasy. (laughs) Wrong thing to tell your unconscious. (laughs) So I started thinking along very large lines. And I was going to, this was going to be, you know, like at the very least, a trilogy. And the idea was to write it so that the surface was action, but that it, but the understructure was very resonant. Mm -hmm. And, And this is guess whose influence. So that started basically a, a six-year journey because as I research, ideas keep forming. Like when I was telling you about that exorcism in the memory cathedral, I had gotten to the point where that happens in the book. And I, I said, no, this is, this is taking me away from the plot in which, in which Leonardo is to work for the Devatar of Egypt, and he's leaving Italy, you know, to go to Syria. Mm -hmm. Well, the characters just went on strike. (laughs) I could not write. I said, I don't want to write this effing thing. So finally, I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll write it. I can cut it out. I'll see where it goes. And that became one of the center poles 
of the novel. And the way that I work, I can't start writing until I can hear my characters talking. I can hear the dialogue. And ironically, this happened with this with the silent. I was maybe a quarter of the way through, and uh, my character Monday McDowell started dictating his own forward to the book. <laughs> now, look, I, I know that I know this is my imagination. I, I do know what's real, although sometimes people around me wonder. And so I uh, I basically transcribed it, <laughs> and at the end, it says like. Scranton, Pennsylvania, 1862. And I thought, none of this novel takes has anything to do with Pennsylvania. <laughs> How did he get there? You know, so I had to I had to work that out. And when I wrote Shadows in the Stone, I came to the end and the characters informed me, as I knew, that this was it. This was the end of the book. And this, this often happens. I, I, I was commissioned to write a, a story for a horror anthology uh, about pregnancy. And I figured this is, it felt right. It felt like it was going to be a novel letter or novella. And I did the same amount of research, which I could have done for a novel letter or novella or a, or a novel. And it turned into a short short. The story ended. The character sat down and said, we're done. So are you. <laughs> so that was that was the idea. The idea for me with Shadows in the Stone was to create a, a viscerally experiential world where the reader experiences the events and perceives the events as the character does. So you interact with the gods. You basically do what Gene's reaction when he was asked if he does it was no comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, it, it just feels very true and very authentic as far as the, the Gnostic world. Well, there's I, I have two responses. One, I do... Th what I consider, you know, my own kind of deep research. But, you know, my partner, who's a, who's a writer and an extraordinary researcher, as a gift, bought me a book called Dr. John Dee's Actions with Spirits. And the actual title is A True and Faithful Relation of what passed for many years between Dr. John D., a mathematician of great, and it, this goes on, the title literally goes on for a page, <laughs> mm -hmm. okay? The book was published in 1659. In 1974, a small press, Askin, I think, did a second edition of maybe 1,200 copies. And what it is, it's a facsimile of Dee's book. And in order to read it, you've, you've got to transpose, you know, the Fs for the Ss because mm -hmm. the language was, was a bit different. But it's got all of the incantations, the spells. So what I did is aside from describing, even though I, I, I don't call him D, it is D in the book, Describing his methods, I used his own descriptions of what he saw and how he worked because he he couldn't see the angels. He, he used someone who claimed mm. that he could see them. But the spells, they're basically D's. Now, the second part of that where it gets tricky is that I have quotes in front of every chapter from various people and from the Gnostic Gospels. And I also have quotes, which I believe I took from something that was actual between uh, Trismegistus and Reginus, where they discuss, you know, as scripture, various aspects of the book. And what I started doing... I started writing my own versions of them in order to direct the reader uh, and inform him of things that I didn't want to do with narrative lumps. 
and to give the book authenticity. When I finished the book and looked at the quotes, many of them were from the Gnostic Gospels themselves. I realized that I couldn't tell which ones I massaged so that they would fit my alternate worldview and which I had left. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, and, and, and one last quick thing. When I was saying that my character, Mundy McDowell, in the Civil War novel, The Silent, had dictated the preface. When the book first appeared on Amazon, it was listed as The Silent by Jack Dan and Mundy McDowell. <laughs> and I thought, nothing could be more perfect than that. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I told Craig, you know, this book, I, I, I was imagining you pitching it like it was to for a movie or something i said okay so the pitch would be it's fellowship of the ring that crawled out of a freemason's ceremony or something it's it's just yeah. i don't think <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> it works now that works uh you know it's it's uh paradise lost in the, in the rents you know one of the thing i i had a film agent who karen borman who was basically like a sister. And when I would go to LA, we'd get together and hang out and she'd set me up with all the studios and I'd pitch and, and I was working with a couple of producers. Nothing happened, of course, welcome to the, the wonderful world of film. <laughs> but I really loved you know, going into these studios on the top floor of the skyscrapers with the cappuccino machines mm -hmm. and doing the pitch because I just considered it silly fun. And well, uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, I was I was going to just say that. No, but so my day job, I'm a Renaissance scholar and, and teach teach online, but it's it's a lot of Renaissance stuff. And that's what my dissertation was, too, which, by the way, congratulations on finishing yours. I saw that. So that's always a nice thing. But yeah, so one thing I just wanted to say is that it's so fun to read this knowing a lot because yeah, I've read all kinds of stuff on John D and Francis Yates work. And, and it's funny when you mentioned the Eros book, I was like, I had no idea about the author who did that because I think I had to read that for exams at one point with some of the stuff I was interested in. So it's so wonderful the way that you bring that side of things out. It feels authentic. It's what I could imagine. So that's, that's awesome. If you can read the Culiano book, did you read it? <laughs> yeah, I had to read it in grad school. Yeah. Yeah. It really is brilliant, and it was just, I mean, I wanted to meet him, and it was just heartbreaking that, you know, that he, that he was killed, because this is another person I think in some way would have been influential uh, in the genre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that, that whole other way to influence it. No, I've, I've kind of, I mean, James was joking about Renaissance punk <laughs> or something like that but yeah, clock punk right clock yeah, punk, yeah. Clock, <laughs> punk. clock punk yeah clock punk but i mean there's so much that's right for it i mean there's john crowley did great stuff with the egypt series um, yes but it's going in a different you know it's sort of the same source material in some ways as you're talking about but does a very different thing but there's definitely a much stronger you know genre flavor that you can get from a lot of the things that are there. And I've always, ever since I've stumbled into it when I was in grad school, I've always thought, no, there's so much that could be done here. And I'm surprised that not as much has been. So I've, I've just been thrilled to, to read this one in particular. Well, Michael, Michael has, has done work uh, mm -hmm. in that, in that period. Yeah. What Culiano startled me with uh, way back when was, was the idea that different p historical periods Mm -hmm. viscerally perceive the world mm -hmm. differently than we do. And, you know, th there's a, in the introduction, uh, I had tied this together later, in the, in the introduction to, to James's book, you know, he has you do this experiment where you, you imagine that, that the center of your being, you know, is not your head, but the, that it's, you know, your heart or, or in your chest. He has a couple of these examples that when you try doing them, you feel viscerally very strange. And, you know, that led me to the idea that 
that this is what historical fiction and historical uh, and analysis needs to be taken into consideration because otherwise we're writing the equivalent of costume drama, mm -hmm. which is why if you see a movie from the forties about Elizabeth, you can tell the era by all of the, su the subtleties of, uh, of the hair cloth, you know, et cetera. <laughs> and so what I wanted to do with the memory cathedral and even more with, with shadows was to give a sense of the alienness of the past. Well, you've done really well. <laughs> well, whether whether I succeeded is you know is, is is another story, but certainly Jean succeeded in writing a far future that feels as real as the as the as as our original early past. If that makes any sense whatsoever, it does indeed. Yeah. Okay, guys. No, yeah. that's wonderful. That was great. So we, well, yeah, like James said, we so appreciate your time. Well, it was it was my great pleasure, you know, talking with you guys. Even though I'm glad, Craig, that you told me that you were uh, a Renaissance scholar at the end <laughs> and not at the beginning of this chat, <laughs> or you might have found it to be a very short podcast <laughs> <laughs> with lots of ahs and ums. Well, when I started. I got to like the second chapter. I, I immediately uh, texted Craig. I said, I said, okay, I like this, but you are really going to like this. So yeah, no. And I, I have to admit, I, I never read memory cathedral and it's always been one that people have told me I should just for, if for the time period, if nothing else. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. But I remember read other plenty of other stuff of yours, but never read that one. And now I told, in fact, I think I told James just a little bit ago, I'm like, God dang, there's so much I need to read like in the next month that I want to get done. And that one is now on the on the list too. So. Yeah, well, the, there's so many books I want to read and, and we know that we, we're not going to do it in our lifetime. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, look, it was it was lovely meeting you guys. This was this great, was great right. fun. Well, great. Terrific. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Questions with mental sutures Trying to make some sense out of reality A renaissance man Tearing himself from the rock Renaissance man Tearing himself from the rock Some star stuff that he's made It's the cosmos that gave him life how does that help him feed the poor? How does that help him love his wife? Tell me, Renaissance man. Renaissance man. Carrying himself from the rock. Renaissance man. Renaissance man. Carrying himself from the rock. Do we need something to back out of this with? Um, I don't think so. And I mean, I think we can just end it with the just end of the... Bang. Yeah.